Um, so this paper is called Deep Ensembles, uh, A Lost Landscape Perspective. Uh, okay, the overview of what I'll just go over is basically what the paper was trying to do, its hypothesis and the empirical uh, research that they did to show it. Um, then I'll, I'll talk about like, the background research that uh, he references and that maybe led up to this paper. Um, then I'll talk about uh, how they measure function similarity within and across trajectories. Um, and we'll get into what that means. Um, and then uh, about the evaluation that they did of ensembling and subspace methods. And then we'll do the conclusion. Awesome. OK, so the hypothesis. So um, sorry, I'm just trying to get my screen to work. OK, yeah, so the importance um, of, of this paper is that when you're given, often we have finite training data. And in a high dimensional space, many, many different parameter values could explain the the finite data that we have the observations and we want to be able to capture the, the this distribution the whole distribution to quantify any epistemic uncertainty that there there is um and so often we're going to be very uncertain about um maybe if there's like a data set shift uh shift in test versus training data you might see uh, this uncertainty and we want to capture the whole distribution to be able to more generalize better to new data. Um, so theoretically, the we have Bayesian neural networks, which can learn a distribution over weights. Um, and a good and there's a number of methods for posterior approximations. Um, and a good one should be able to learn uh, multimodal distributions, which you can see in this graph. Uh, in the top right, that uh, th basically what they call a mode is a unique function. Um, and so you can see this is kind of a graph of a space of solutions. And these are of the y axis is the loss, um, and uh, the x axis is the weight space. And so they're trying to show here that variational methods like Bayesian neural networks approximations uh, can capture uncertainty around a mode. Um, and it's highlighted in red. And then, but there's also like these other optimas here. And these, these uh, empirically, we've seen that um, ensembles tend to outperform approximate, approximate Bayesian neural networks in both accuracy and uncertainty because they're able to capture multiple modes, whereas uh, a Bayesian neural network uh, empirically isn't, isn't doing that well. Um, and you can see here, the problem with that is that the validation in, in the training set, the validation, the validation error, the best validation error or redu reduction in loss, it might not be the same. Like uh, for this mode, it's not as it's not as good as the other modes, and so ensembles help. Oops, ensembles help um, capture that, improve accuracy, and capture the uncertainty in multiple modes. And so the hypothesis that they want to test is ensemble methods capture uncertainty in multiple modes, whereas Bayesian neural networks only capture uncertainty in one mode. Okay, so um, some of the background research. Uh, Goodfellow and Vignals observed that the loss along a linear path from an initialization to the corresponding optimum is monotonically decreasing, encountering no significant obstacles along the way. So this is basically saying um, we, we're in this really high dimensional space usually, and we often don't know what the lost landscape looks like. Um, and so they, they did a number of experiments that show that Although SGD often might get stuck in flat areas um, or, or it bumps, uh, the loss will go up and down due to noise in, in the stochastic 
estimate of the gradient. Um, they found that although that is the case, there there is a, a linear path from an initialization to the optimum that actually the loss is decreasing the whole time. And so it doesn't really encounter any uh, like um, obstacles such as like in the if you think of the lost landscape uh, as like geography, it doesn't it doesn't encounter any like mountains uh, as it's going down to the local minimum. Um, and this implies that if we knew the direction this this linear path, then it could do a, a, a good job of training the network and maybe faster. Oops. Okay, and then um, some more background research. Uh, th these authors um, did a paper on just visualizing lost landscapes, and they focused especially on different neural architectures and how neural architectures can face or uh, can can change the the lost landscape and here you can see one of their tests with with uh cnn's uh with skip connections and without skip connections and the lost landscape is much smoother with skip connections um so that shows that neural architectures can have a great effect on the degree of complexity of lost landscapes and their complexity um yeah, and then more recently, uh, these authors demonstrated th these graphs are basically showing uh, lost landscapes, and they're and these are local optima. And so the red is basically the lowest loss, um, and these dots are showing the local optima. And they found that although we might think of of lost landscapes like the the plot on the far left uh where these where to get from one to the other you have to go over like a high loss area or something like there's no path from one to the next uh that is low loss they actually found that um you can do draw a continuous path between local optima um it's actually like the the far two figures on the graph um, and so they found there there exists continuous low loss paths connecting any pair of optima. Uh, and then finally, um, leading up to this paper, uh, the, the these authors showed that, or or they they started digging into um, low loss optima and how how they're connected, but how the functions that um, are in the weight, the weight space of the different optimas um, are, are different functions in terms of their predictions. And so that this paper will uh, delve deeper into that. Cool. OK, so getting back to this paper. Um, we. So, so he starts out by measuring function similarity within and across trajectories. And a trajectory is basically um, um, like a training, a training cycle. So you start, you initialize at one at one point in the, in the weight space, and then you're training and uh, throughout a number of epochs, and then you get to your uh, local optima. And so. Um, the methodology that this, these authors use was they they mainly use three different classifiers: uh, a small like on a CNNs, um, a small, a medium, and a large with similar hyperparameters, and they mainly use the CIFAR10 data set, um, which they all and they also did tests on larger data sets like ImageNet and uh, CIFAR100, uh, um, just to see if their findings held across those, and they did. Um, and they used Atom Optimizer and a vanilla uh, SGD to compare the two. And then the evaluation, they used two main metrics, cosine similarity between the parameter spaces. And so that basically means they, they measured uh, the angle between the two vectors, the weight, weight vectors, um, to see how similar um, these, these weight spaces are or weight vectors are. 
And then they also measured the fraction of labels that the models uh, disagree on. And so that is, that is once they have these models, they measured um, how many of the predictions were the same. And they measured these within a training tra trajectory. So within one run of a model, uh, one training cycle of an initialization. And then um, also with, within, they, they do subspace sampling, which we'll get to, um, and across initializations. So ensembling, deep ensembling, as you might know, uh, is basically you're running, you're training multiple models from different uh, initializations. Okay, um, so here kind of is their, their first findings. Um, uh, you can see on the left, the far left one, that here's the cosine similarity. And um, so, so uh, cosine similarity in high, high dimensional space, two, two random vectors are likely to have like a roughly zero uh, cosine similarity. So um, here you can see that along it, this is along a trajectory. So you're starting at, these are epochs. Um, the checkpoint ID is the epoch. And so the diagonal represents like those will all be one because it's, it's the same epoch. But uh, in this, in the, um, and, but as you train further, you get more dissimilar, but it's still quite similar um, compared to what you'll see later on um, across trajectory. So this is within a trajectory. Um, and then uh, the middle graph shows disagreement within the predictions. So it's showing how the fraction of, uh, the fraction of labels they disagree on. And so you can see, obviously the diagonal is zero. They, they agree on all of them because it's the same point in time. But uh, if you compare like zero to thirty, um, you can see there's some there's dis there's definitely some dissimilarity there because the model is uh, hopefully getting better at predicting uh, the labels and and when you initialize a random model, you're usually uh, before you start training, uh, you're you're doing just random guesses. Um, so then they also did TSNE graphs, which helped. Uh, visualize high dimensional things and lower dimensions um, and this is of the predictions and so they they did three different models three different trajectories and uh, you can see as they train uh, they they kind of go to their own area um, and they don't overlap so this is showing that these the, fu the functions that we're learning are really actually very different functions in terms of their prediction space and uh, their weight space. Okay. Um, and then here you can see um, this, these are different solutions, independent solutions. So they ran multiple, these are across trajectories. So there's they were, they ran multiple different models uh, with different initializations and you can see that the diagonal is the same comparing the same model so they're going to be the same but uh, the other like the models the different models are very different from each other here in cosine similarity and um, also within the fraction of predictions. And then that's the, the two left ones are using simple CNN and uh, the two right ones are uh, on a ResNet. Okay, then, so, so after they've established that uh, basically within, within a tra training trajectory, you see high similarity even within like your initialization versus where the local optima that you get to is. Uh, it's high, highly similar in, in the weight space and in predictions versus across trajectories. 
So different initialization, so different ensemble. Like if you do an ensemble, you have maybe 10 different models. And across those, they're very, they're very dissimilar compared to within a trajectory. And then they wanted to look at um, kind of within trajectories, they did subspace, subspace sampling, and they used four different subspace sampling methods. Um, so subspace sampling, the like random would just be you start at whatever weight parameters you have, and you choose a direction, a vector in whatever dimensional space you're in, and you step in that direction by some value. And you do this for many different directions and distances, and that'll give you, uh, you're basically sampling around the, the weight space that you're in randomly. And then there's Monte Carlo dropout, which you're applying dropout to the weight space randomly. Um, so it's, it's a little different method. And then you have diagonal Gaussian subspace and low rank Gaussian subspace, which are very similar. Uh, you calculate, for, for both you calculate the mean and standard deviation of the last few epochs um, for each parameter. And then you sample from that distribution that's defined by that mean and standard deviation. And the only difference with the low rank one is that you take the top K principal components to reduce the, the dimensions. So that's just the subspace sampling methods they use. And then we get to kind of the graphs back to the TS and E plots. Um, and these show that you can see the trajectories are uh, very different, like we saw before. Um, and with all the subsample or all the subspace sampling methods, you can see they all cluster around um, all the cluster around their trajectory, and there are really no overlaps. And that's still showing that even with these subspace sampling methods, like these these functions that are learned are very different in their predictions. Okay, and then. Um, Building on top of that, uh, you, you can see this graph is showing validation accuracy versus prediction diversity, which is the fraction of the labels, the fraction of labels that are different. And so they compare it to this baseline optimum. So the green star is the baseline optimum, and that's getting a validation accuracy of 0.7 on the far left, uh, far left graph. And then they run the the red stars are the different the other initializations uh, different trajectories than the the green star, whereas the the subspace sampling methods are shown with all the little dots and those um, you can see there's a trade off there between um, the the prediction diversity and validation accuracy that isn't as good as the the independent optima. Okay, then um, here, here they're showing uh, radial plots, and um, it's a, it's a plot of um, training set accuracy and validation set accuracy, and they they show that the and then the green the the amount of the darker the green the the um higher the accuracy basically and so you can see that these are like two distinct optimum um and that in the bottom two graphs they're showing the similarity and you can see that like the similarity is pretty small between between the two areas even though they obtain very similar accuracies. And so while, while the loss values from different optima are similar and the accuracy is similar, the functions have like different prediction spaces, which confirms that random initialization leads to different modes in, in the function space. And so then they, they follow up on previous research uh, about that I talked about uh, before um, about low loss tunnels between Optima um, and how as you get further towards the other Optima, the fraction of different labels increases. So although, so on the left, on the far left, you can see like this is 
a cartoon illustration of well, what it might look like. Um, you have these two initializations in green and you train and then you get to these two different optimums. And although they're, they're both low loss uh, areas, um, they're very different. And then as, as the previous paper showed, you can find um, a continuous path, the yellow dotted line uh, between the two, that's a low loss tunnel is what they call it because yeah, you're staying at low loss. Um, and so, um, but as you get further, um, so you, in the first, in the middle two graphs, you can see they do a linear interpolation of the two optimum and then they train it and that's how they get to uh, the yellow uh, dotted lines. And you can see um, the train on tunnel uh, stays very low loss, whereas like if you train on the linear line, which is this dotted black line, uh, the, the loss increases and then decreases as you reach the other optimum. And same as the validation loss and the train loss. And the, you can see a very similar graph for accuracy uh, as loss. And then on the far right, you see that um, the difference in labels uh, actually, is, they're very different between the two optimum as you, as you go from one to the other. Okay, and then this graph is showing it, uh, is a radial graph of uh, the situation that we just saw. Um, and it's showing that you have these two optimums and the, there's, a, there's this certain path that you can go that is a low loss path from one optimum to another, but that at the same time, uh, they're very uh, dissimilar in their prediction space. Okay, so where is this going? We we started we started with this empirical observation that Bayesian neural networks weren't or ensemble deep ensembles were performing better than Bayesian neural networks in accuracy and uncertainty, um, and they they hypothesized that this was because uh, ensemble methods, which use multiple models randomly initialized. Um, we're able to explore different functions, um, and whereas Bayesian neural networks might be showing uncertainty only ar around one mode uh, or one function space. And so the previous the previous slides have shown that there's mo multiple local optima that have uh, maybe very similar accuracy and loss, but um, but these these are very dissimilar in uh, what predictions they're making. Okay, so then uh, the authors went on to evaluate the effects of using deep ensembles and subspace methods. And so they, they compared six variants um, performances. First is the baseline, which is just training a single model. And then, uh, and then you have the subspace sampling where you average predictions over the solution sampled from a subspace. And then you have stochastic weight averaging, which we haven't talked about yet, but it's basically you take the mean of the weights over the last training epochs. And, um, and then ensemble methods, which are train the baseline multiple times, but um, from different random initializations and average the predictions. And then you can combine ensemble and subspace sampling and ensemble and stochastic weight averaging. And so these graphs show accuracy and uh, test accuracy and test Briar. Briar is just a, a score for probability. Um, of basically, it takes the difference between the probability outputs um, and tries to minimize those. Um, so a low briar is, is a good score and uh, high test accuracy is obviously better than low tech test accuracy. And so these, the top two graphs show low rank Gaussian subsampling um, along with ensemble and without ensemble and both together. So you can see that um, using ensembling 
of using either alone definitely increases it over uh, just the baseline. But if you use both, you, you get even higher accuracy. Um, and it's the same for the diagonal Gaussian um, subsampling method. Um, so, but the problem with these subsampling methods are you're, you're having to add, use multiple, uh, you're adding parameters to the model. Um, you need, you need for like low rank, uh, Gaussian, you, you're doing, um, computations to find the, sorry, let me go back to the low rank Gaussian. Oh. So you're having to calculate uh, the mean and standard deviation, and then draw from that that um, that distribution. Whereas, and so so these authors, since that is more computationally uh, inefficient, they wanted to use stochastic weight averaging um, because when when you stochastic weight average, you just need to keep track of the last few means of the the weights, and so. Uh, or you can do an exponentially weighted uh, average as you go along. And so instead of using the, the subspace sampling methods like low rank Gaussian, which increases the number of parameters uh, required for each mode, they explored using stochastic weight averaging. And, and you can see a very similar effect here that uh, both together, stochastic weight averaging and ensemble, uh, improves the accuracy over the baseline and uh, using the two separately. And then um, the bottom two graphs are results on CIFAR 10C, which is like corrupted uh, images. And you can see uh, the corruption intensity goes, uh, this is a graph of test accuracy versus corruption intensity. And as the corruption intensity goes up, your accuracy is obviously going to go down. But um, the the weight averaging and the ensemble method does the best here, also. And then here is another radial graph of the training accuracy and validation accuracy. Um, and the top the top two graphs are just uh, the the local optima, and the bottom two are using weight uh, stochastic weight averaging on the last five epochs. And uh, you can see that the the accuracy landscape is is better in the in the weight averaging. It, it just it just generalizes better um, compared to just using the last uh, point estimate of the weights. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, the the authors basically say that. Um, their hypothesis um, that the that the different modes or that um, ensemble methods do better than Bayesian neural networks because of different they explore different modes uh, they they think that that is plausible um, and because it definitely showed that they explored different modes and that these are roughly or like orthogonal to each other in weight space and very diverse in predictions. And so they're really, although they're getting maybe a similar test accuracy amongst the local optima, you're exploring uh, a more diverse uh, weight space and function space. Um, so that was one, one of the things they showed. And then they said uh, also, Although there are low loss tunnels between optima, the different optima found by ensemble methods correspond to different distinct functions. So that's very similar. Um, and then you can you can kind of combine ensemble methods with um, subspace sampling or stochastic weight averaging, and uh, it gives you improvement over the baseline and uh, helps improve that accuracy. But they aren't able to explore different modes without doing new trajectories or, or new uh, training new models from different initializations. Yeah, so um, that that was the presentation. And if you guys have any like questions, comments, ideas, I don't know how much 
you read into it, but I'd love to answer any questions or hear any comments or ideas, and we can start in discussion about about this paper. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear uh, you. Yeah. Could you go back to the previous slide, the, the final one? Yes. Thank you. Um, one second, I'm trying to get out of... Uh, right. Okay, let's share again. Okay, can you see uh, the slides now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Would you know which slide that you want you want to look at? The the conclusion slide. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah actually, yeah, because uh, I was just wondering, uh, uh, I was thinking, what's the intuition behind the first point that you're having? Why is it that uh, the Bayesian methods are not finding the different modes? Is it because of the sampling methods they use in Bayesian uh, Bayesian methods? They are not powerful enough to find those modes. Yeah, this this paper actually doesn't go too much into why Bayesian methods aren't doing that well, but they show they just say that empirically they see that uh, their accuracy and uncertainty isn't as good as these ensemble methods. Um, but I think that's like an interesting follow up to this paper to like because theoretically Bayesian methods should be able to capture the whole distribution, but I think their approximations um, maybe struggle struggle with that empirically um, and so they were they were just digging deeper into the ensemble and why why maybe the ensemble or showing why ensemble methods work well yeah, okay thank you um yeah, it's funny. It's funny giving a presentation because you don't see anybody else. But <laughs> I hope you guys could hear me all the whole, the whole time. <laughs> Any other uh, questions or like ideas or comments or discussion topics that you want to bring up? I, I just have like, <laughs> this is basically the follow-up question on uh, what they asked before. I, I'm just thinking how, how, how comprehensive do you think there, there has been their, their experimental like settings and results? Do you, do you think we can, we can trust this, like these uh, results mm. that they're having? Yeah, so I think they did a, a pretty good job of uh, exploring they mostly use CNNs, different CNNs. Um, but as I just said before, like, uh, I think they did a good job with that. Like they explored different data sets and different, uh, different sizes of CNN and ResNet versus maybe a simple CNN. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it applies pretty broadly to um, those, those sorts of problems. Um, also, people have been using ensemble methods and and have they've been shown to work well uh but um i think this paper is cool because they kind of talk about why why they work well based on the loss on the lost landscape um so maybe maybe uh to answer your question that uh, i would say that you'd have to be more careful about using them in other circumstances, but I think they explored this this one pretty well and the empirical data definitely backs up um, that the, they show improvement there. So stochastic weight averaging and ensemble methods definitely help in these sort of circumstances. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Makes sense.
Um, if if no one has any other questions, then I guess we can uh, end it here. But but let me know if you do. Uh, can, can we have the slides? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll share the slides, and this session should be recorded. So I think. Oh, okay. Great. Okay.